I also want to thank God because last, last week, me and my wife celebrated seven years of marriage, so I want to thank God for that. So, God's blessed me, my wife, and my family, so I, I want to give thanks to God for all that, everything that he's done for, for me and my family. So, um, so the verse that we're going to be reading today says, uh, Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So I want to appreciate you guys today on the title, Where Are Your Thoughts Leading You? So, let's bow our heads and, and pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we come before you, Lord, to worship you, to lift you up this morning, Lord. We thank you for all the blessings that you've done in our lives, Lord Jesus, for all the things that you have done, Lord, for that sacrifice you did at the cross for us, Lord, so we can be here today and be able to worship you with freedom, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for this morning, Lord. For this opportunity you've given us to hear your word, Lord, I ask that you speak to us, that you anoint your servant, Lord, that you speak your word through me, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can take your seats. So, where are your thoughts leading you? I mean, because, you know, there's always thoughts in our heads, even right now, that you guys are sitting here, you guys are thinking of something. And it's, it's, it's all right, you know, it's, it, that's how our heads, that our mind works. That we've been, we think a lot. We think more than we speak. And, and lately, I, you know, this is what is, is happening. The, the last year and a half, there's been a lot of thinking going on in these days. And especially the last year and a half. You know, we, our minds have been thinking over time. They've been thinking about everything that's going on in this world. From the pandemic, the riots, everything. So our, our minds have been going crazy. They've been thinking about everything. We thought of the future. We thought of, uh, of losing our things. We thought of losing our health. We thought of losing our jobs. We thought of losing our possessions, our homes. And we've seen friends, loved ones, brothers, sisters from church lose all these things. And sometimes, you know, we've seen brothers and sisters that have lost their lives in the last year and a half. And we think about all these things and we think about what's going on. And we start thinking, what if this happens to me? You know, those are thoughts that come, well, what if that comes to me? And all this, what's causing is it's, we're getting mentally exhausted of all this thinking. You know, the last year and a half, we're thinking a lot of everything that's going on. So it's, it's a mental you know, it's exhaustion that we get. And it can happen to anyone, whoever experiences long-term stress. It can make you feel overwhelmed and emotionally drained and make your responsibilities and problems seem impossible to overcome. You may feel trapped in your situation and, and as if there's no power to do anything, and it's out of your hands. And lots of the thoughts that we've been thinking lately, and it's been going in our minds. But then we start praying, and we start asking God for protection, and we, we ask Him to protect us from all these things, and we start declaring His protection over me, my wife, my children, our family, our jobs, to protect us from all these tragedies that's going on. But then, sometimes tra tragedy strikes. And we put our trust in the Lord, and we start to remember how God saved us so many times, and we start thinking, well, God can save me now. He saved me then, He can save me now. Now we see in the Bible, and, and we get more, more hope, that we see in the Bible how God helped so many people. We saw how He helped David for many, many times. We saw how He saved Daniel from the lion's den. And we think about this, and it gives us hope. And say, he did it for them, he can do it for me. Then we hear how a brother or a sister was saved from the same situation that we're going through. And we say, God can help me too. And then we start thinking how they receive their blessing and how they receive their healing. How the pastor laid his hands on them and prayed for them and they received their miracle. And then we start thinking, well, God should heal me the same exact way that that brother or sister got healed. And we start thinking in our minds, if I just do the same thing, I should be able to get healed. But we are letting our thoughts tell God how He should heal us or how He should bless us. Because the God that we serve does not work according to our thoughts. And He does not work how we think. He works in different ways. So the same brother that, that got healed is not the same way that I'm going to be healed. The same way the brother got blessed is not the same way I'm going to be blessed. Sometimes there's a blessing coming and we think, 
It's not from God because it didn't happen the same way that the sisters did it. And we just let it go. And we think, well, I don't think it was from God because I haven't seen God work that way. And we say, if it's not done this way, then I don't want it. If it's not the same way that I've been thinking in my mind, then it's not from God. We're just limiting God to our thoughts. But don't let your thoughts steal your blessing. Don't let your thoughts steal your healing. Let me, let me tell you what. We all know the story of Naaman, right? The, the great general, commander of the Syrian army, right? We know he was a great man. He, was a, he won so many battles, and he had, a, he had an issue. You know, he was sick. He had a le leprosy. But then one day, he heard his uh, slave girl or a servant that he, he told his, uh, his wife, if only my master could go to Samaria and the prophet would pray for him and he would be healed from his leprosy. So he heard this and he asked the king, can I go? And he said, yeah, I'll write a letter to the king of Samaria or king of Israel and you can be in your way. So on his way over there, you know, he says that he took camels and horses and he got there and when he got there, he got to the king and the king told him, what, what am I, God, to, to, to give life and take away? And then the prophet here, the Naaman was there, and he, he, he told him, send him to my house. They'll, he'll see that there's a real prophet in, in, in Israel. So Naaman goes to the house of the prophet, and when he gets there, the prophet doesn't come out. The servant comes out and tells him, my Lord says to go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. What this happened was Naaman, Naaman got so mad and so angry that he said, I thought, he said, I thought he would surely come out and stand and call the name of the Lord, wave his hand over me, and heal me on the spot. Can you imagine, you know, being sick for that long? And then you hear of this man that can pray for you and you will be healed. So maybe you heard that that's the way God heals when someone prays over you, lays hands over you, and you'll be, you'll be healed. So I'm guessing on his trip, on his way to Samaria, you know, it was like a two, three day trip, he would wake up every morning and think, I just need the, 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 the prophet to, to lay hands on me and I'll be, I'll be healed. And he kept thinking that over and over and over again. Maybe he kept thinking it. And so he made it a reality that that's the only way he should be healed. So when he gets there, the prophet doesn't come out, doesn't pray for him, doesn't lay hands on him, and he says, I don't want this. Wow. It's not the way I thought it would be. He says, I thought he would come out and, and pray for me. Yeah. And he rejected his healing. But one of his servants told him, Lord, if he would have asked you to do something greater, you would have done it. And he said, and then he eventually he went and uh, and washed the river, and he became healed. But his thoughts were stealing his blessing because he said, "I'm going to be healed this way, and this is the only way I should be healed." Because this is this is what it, the thing was that he just heard that that's the way God works. And that's the problem with some of us that we just hear of how God works. But the thing is that we know God is that He doesn't work that way. He works in mysterious ways. Amen. Is that that's why Job said, I've, only, I've heard of you by hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Yeah. Because we say, I see the sister being healed like that. I see the brother being healed. This is the way God should work on me. But he almost lost his, his healing. He almost lost his blessing because his thoughts kept telling them, this is the way you should be healed. And the Lord says that my thoughts are not your thoughts. You know, my ways are not your ways. So God works in the mysterious ways. We pray for God for a certain thing and then we receive something else, but it's a blessing. We say, it's not from God. It's not a blessing from God. We pray to God that our husband or wife should be a certain way. Now maybe I shouldn't go there, but 
It says that we should be, no, he should be this, he should, she should be that, he should have a house, or he should have a career, a lawyer, a doctor. But God said, what you need is a man of God. What you need is a prayer, a man, a God, a, a daughter of God, a man of prayer. That's what you need in your life. Amen. And we're making thoughts in our heads and saying, wow. this is the only way it should be do, it should be done. Wow. Let me tell you because, let me tell you why, because our thoughts, they have tremendous ability to shape our life, either for good or for bad. Because, for example, maybe you, when you were growing up, you accepted a thought that said that someone told you you're worthless or you don't matter. Even though it was wrong, even though it wasn't true, you accepted the thought and it has shaped you the way you are now. You must choose what, you, what thoughts affect you, Amen. for good or for bad. Because when I see someone being blessed, and when I see someone in the same situation that I'm in, and they get out of it, God heals them or gives them uh, the blessing, and I'm still here praying and asking God, and struggling with the situation, and there's no help. And then I start thinking, my thoughts come to my head and say, I don't think God loves me enough. I don't think God cares for me enough. You know, if I'm going to the same situation as that brother or sister, he's already out of it, and I'm here struggling, you know, thoughts come to our heads and say, I don't think God loves me enough. Yeah. Yeah. See, the enemy wants to put those thoughts in you. He loves to put thoughts in the believer's mind. That's right. And if you're meditating those thoughts, those thoughts will produce strongholds. And then it produces feelings, which lands you into bondage. Wow. All because you believe one thought. That's the power of your mind. And one thought that comes to my head all the time is, you're not enough. I don't know if you guys ever get that thought, or you guys get that thought all the time. You're not enough. I might be praying, I might be reading the Bible, I might be worshiping, playing video games, and for some reason, it comes to my mind. I'm not enough. And, and, and then it comes and says, you can't preach that. You can't say that. You can't minister because you're not a pastor. You, you don't have the authority to preach that or to preach that word. And how many times have we rejected God? How many times have we rejected a blessing from God? Because we think, because our thought says that we're not enough. Maybe God wants to give us something and use us in a mighty way, but our head is telling us that we're not enough. And we reject the calling of God. Because I have God speaking in my mind, and then I have the enemy speaking in on, on my, on my thoughts too. So I have one boy saying, preach the word. You're going to, you're going to preach it because it's my word. But then I have another word, another thought saying, you can't preach that. You're going to upset some people. One was telling me, you're forgiven. And no, you're loved. Or the other one is telling me, you can't be loved. You can't be forgiven after what you just did. One was telling me, go deeper. Speak. Step into it. Go to the other side. But then the other voice tells me, don't go too far. Don't go too deep because you're going to be embarrassed. You're going to go out there on your own. No one's going to follow you. You'll be out there drowning in the water just like Peter did. And many times we look at Peter and say that he failed because he was drowning in the water, but if that little faith made him walk in water, what kind of faith did the other ones have that stayed on the boat? But if God's telling me, and the voice of God tells me, don't worry about it. You go, if you, I'll be there with my hand extended ready to help you. And all this is playing in our minds. All these thoughts are in our minds, and we're caught between a thought. So where is your, your thoughts leading you? You know, God's telling you to go deeper, and the other one's telling you you can't go anywhere. If you believe the enemy, you're going to sit there and stay there where you are. But if you believe God, if you believe God, you're going to walk, and you're going to go deeper into a better place, into a spiritual life. But if you stay there, and you speak negative, you're going to stay in a negative place. Because just the verse that we read, it says, 
the power is in your mouth. Amen. If you speak negative, you're going to eat fruit, negative fruits. If you eat positive, you're going to eat positive fruits. So what, are you, what fruits are you eating? What thoughts are taking control of your mind? Because just as God we believe and faith open the door for the things of God, your negative thoughts and belief and fear opens the door for the enemy. Because just the slightest doubt, the slightest fear gives the enemy a plain field to work with. The slightest fear you have or your doubt gives the enemy room to work with. You're giving them plenty of room just by a little doubt. And that's what that's going on in your mind. Thinking that I'm not enough, thinking that negative things are going to come to my life. And again, the power of life and death is in, is in our mouth because what we speak, you know, it comes true. If I started speaking fear in, my, my, in me and my family or anything negative, what's the enemy going to do? He's going to bring that fear into me. We all know the story of Job and how he was a righteous man. But when everything was going on in his life, he said, what I always fear has happened to me. What I dreaded has come true. I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest. Only trouble comes. He says that his fear had happened to him. What he always feared happened to him. And his biggest fear he had, he says that is losing his children. And we know that God allowed the enemy to do all these things, but many people say that his fear is the one that allowed it to come. But I don't know if that's true or not, but one thing I do know is that when I start praying negative, when I start praying with fear, my prayers are not going to go anywhere. If I start praying out of fear, out of doubt, my, my prayers are not going anywhere. Because the Bible says that God works according to our faith. And without faith, I can't please God. So if I make a prayer with doubt, my prayer is not going to go anywhere. The mighty hand of God moves according to my faith. The miracles happen according to my faith. So if I start praying out of fear, if I start praying out of doubt, my prayers are not going anywhere. You know what those prayers are actually doing? We're just giving weapons to the enemy to work with. Because the enemy hears our prayers. You guys know the story of Daniel. When Daniel was praying, uh, the, the, the angel was trying to uh, speak to Daniel, but the enemy was fighting him. And then eventually uh, he came and he told Daniel, he said, Daniel, don't fear. For the first day that you set your heart to understand and humble yourself before God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. So why are we speaking in our lives? What, what are, who are we bringing into our lives? God or the enemy? If I'm speaking doubt in my life, who's going to take over me? If I start speaking, start speaking faith, start speaking healing and declaring the, the God, He's going to come to our life. The, the words that we speak attract either God or the enemy. So we speak words of life and we're attracting God. And then we speak negative and doubt and dead. Well, the enemy is going to come because they just said, your words are the ones that made me come. Your word, I'm here because of your words because of what you spoke. See, Satan knew the fear that Job had. And I'm not saying that, you know, his fear is the one that caused all No, no, What I'm saying is that the Satan knew the fear of Job. And he said, if I can bring that fear to him, if I can make that happen, he's going to quit on God. If I can bring that fear to his, to his heart, then he's going to curse God. Because he said, what, what I fear has come upon me. And one of the biggest fears that as a Christian, you know, as I have is feeling alone or feeling left or forsaken by God. 
That, that's you know, one of the biggest fears that we have. Even David said, do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. You know, Jesus was beaten. He was put in a crown of thorns. He was crucified, but he didn't open his mouth. But when God forsaken him, when God abandoned him, he said, he cried out and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? All that stuff that he was going through, he didn't help him. But as soon as God has, had abandoned him, he cried out with a loud voice. Because being alone is not a good feeling. And what the enemy wants to do is that he wants to bring that fear into you so you can think that you're alone and say, God, the biggest fear that I had has come to me. I don't think you were with me then. And I don't think you're with me right now. And that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to make you feel that you're alone, that you are fighting this battle by yourself. But God has been with me all the time. God has been with us the whole time. God was with Job the whole time. Even because he said to me, to Satan, you can do everything, but you can't touch his life. So God was still protecting Job. But how do, how do we overcome these thoughts? You know, how do, you, how do we overcome just like Job did? Everything that he was going through, the Bible says that he never cursed God or he never left God. Remember, this is what Job said in the, this is what Job 4, 6 says. Doesn't your reverence for God give you confidence? Doesn't your life on journey give you hope? In other words, then, doesn't the fear for God give you confidence? Doesn't the obedience of God give you confidence? Doesn't obeying God give you the strength to continue on? How do we overcome this? You know, it says that right. If we fear God and if we love God, obey God, He will give us the confidence. But in our minds, there's many thoughts that's going on saying, God will not save you now. God has left you by yourself. Because the enemy attacked where, the, where we are the most vulnerable. When Jesus was fasting, what did the enemy do? He tempted with food. Because the enemy wants to attack when you're the most vulnerable. What your biggest fear is, he wants to attack that and make you feel that God has left you. But where are your thoughts leading you? Which ones are you believing? I want you guys to stand up. And, and, and think about this. When, 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 I'm, when I'm going through something, when, I'm, when those negative thoughts come and you know, say that I'm not enough, that I shouldn't be up here preaching because I'm nobody, or because I'm here, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a, a minister or a pastor. What I say is, my head is full of thoughts already. I don't have room for no more negative thoughts. I don't have room for negative thoughts at all. There's no room in my head for these thoughts when I'm thinking of these things. Because this is what Paul said. Finally, my brothers, this is whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. So there's no room for me to be thinking about negative stuff when I'm thinking about the love of God. There's no room in my head for negative thoughts when I'm thinking of the joy of God. That's right. There's no room in my head when I'm thinking of the truth of God. Amen. This is what Paul said, you should think of these things. If it's noble, think about it. If it's true, think about it. If it's not, then you shouldn't be thinking of those things. Wow. You shouldn't be giving space to those things. Amen. So, how can I be thinking of negative stuff when I'm thinking about these things? 
this whole concept. Think about these things. Anything that's true, that's noble, that's pure, and that's love, 